Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Ben, Ishai, and all other organizers. Before I get started, Ishai asked me for all the presenters tomorrow to send the slides so you can upload them. So if you can, please. Okay, so it's a great conference, and it's great to be here in Israel, and this conference particularly. I'm actually quite excited about the topic of the conference. Uh, you will see in a few minutes that this paper is very much about engagement. Um, so actually, let me get started uh, without any uh, more motivation. Okay, so who are these guys? These are, um, you know, we all, most of us are familiar with, these are very prominent hedge fund managers uh, in, the, in the US, activist hedge fund managers. And they have a pretty strong view and opinion about companies they target, comp companies they invest in, about how these companies should be managed, okay? And, you know, these are kind of what we sometimes uh, call like alpha types, right? Alpha males, sort of. They are very aggressive, often. Oftentimes, and uh, if you will let them have control of these companies, or if they could, they would definitely try to impose their view. Okay? They believe that they are um, um, have a good idea how to manage these companies. The problem, of course, is that obtaining control of a public companies, at least in the U.S., but also in other countries, is not that trivial. You need to buy sufficient number of voting shares or win both seats. Um, and you know these things are hard. You need to do the takeovers. You need to do proxy fight. You litigate. There are security regulations which limit the extents to which you can um, accumulate these positions. Companies can defend themselves using poison pills, target board, all of these defense tactics, which we know some of them are quite, quite um, effective. As a matter of practice, it's very rare to see an activist holding a majority stake, and even more than 10%, that's not that common, okay? So the bottom line, what I want sort of to, to so my starting point is that Activist investors and investors more generally, they cannot simply impose their views on companies they invest in. Okay? <laughs> what they can do, they can try to convince either managers and directors or shareholders that their ideas have some value. Okay? If they are unable to persuade, and that's really the key word, to persuade um, managers that their proposal can make some sense, um, then either they remain passive, wait for whatever might happen, or they can exit. Okay? So the main premise of this paper is that, in a very fundamental way, shoulder activism, effective shoulder activism, requires communications, okay? Requires some dialogue with the firms. When I say communication, what I really have in mind is some sort of, you know, conversations, meeting, emails, any mean by which you can sort of transmit some information, tell managers, tell insiders, tell, tell other shareholders what you have in mind and how you might be able to change the course of the company. And the agenda, indeed, in many cases, as we know from previous literature and some anecdotes, it's about payout policy, uh, you know, changing the, the, the balance sheet. Uh, it could be about divesting some non-core assets, selling the company, and so on and so forth. Okay, so let me give you some uh, sort of anecdote which I find interesting in this context. One is, this is a quote from the SEC, uh, former SEC chairman, saying basically, boards can also benefit from access to ideas and concerns investors may have. Good communication can build credibility with shareholders and potentially enhance corporate strategies, at least suggesting that it's valuable to listen to shareholders, potentially. Um, I'm a little bit more concrete uh, anecdote. Uh, this is by David Heiner, and again, another prominent activist hedge fund manager, basically saying when we offer companies private advice, sort of suggesting that they are engaging companies trying to show their ideas, they either take it or they explain why they are not going to take it. Sometimes we agree to disagree, and then we decide whether to hold the stock or exit the position. Okay? So what I want to emphasize here is that you know, you can get into a dialogue with the firm, it might not be fruitful, and then you might decide to sort of sell and move on. Or not, you just stay, stick around. As another example, this is Elliott Management, um, 2012, going after a software company, BMC, and here is a letter um, that um, they sent to the board members describing their engagement with management, basically saying, we initiate a dialogue with senior management about exploring pathways together to create greater value for, show, for <laughs> stockholders. In turn, BMC responded by issuing a press release and adopting a poison pill. Clearly, it indicates that that was not a fruitful dialogue between um, Elliott and, and BMC. Shortly after, Elliott nominated directors. Eventually, they settled. They got, like, I think, like two board members. And a year later, BMC was acquired. Okay? So basically, Elliott went to a public campaign afterwards, trying to first nominate their directors and then um, um, sway other shareholders to support them in an effort to sell the companies. Okay? So here, uh, this dialogue was followed by what I call voice, 
um, this proxy fight. It doesn't have to be proxy fight per se, but it's like a public campaign where um, you're trying to exert more pressures. Okay? Um, and in fact, we've seen today a very interesting paper, which I was not aware of, um, about dialogues, not necessarily by activists per se, but dialogues between firms and, uh, and uh, between investors and firms. Uh, but there is, I think, an emerging literature which sort of suggests that the idea of communications between investors and firms, um, and, and the emphasis, emphasis is investors talking to firms, trying to inform them about um, you know, how the firm should be managed or their preference and so on and so forth, is, be, is quite prevalent. So the first point is from, from Alon's uh, papers where it's not a direct evidence, but at least on the 13th day, many f hedge funds are saying they intend to communicate with firms. Whether or not they're doing that, that's a different question. So we have the survey by Laura Starks and her quarters that um, majority of institutional investors say they engage uh, with that discussion with management and boards, and they argue that most of these discussions are going behind the scenes. So the challenge empirically is that we oftentimes don't observe these this communications. And, uh, here is another is an interesting survey performed by Deloitte, they survey CFO, and they are arguing that in the past five years, uh, when the survey was, was taken, 60% of public companies were targeted, at least the CEO was contacted by an activist uh, shareholders, communicating directly with them or other uh, um, uh, senior executives. And there is a bunch of other papers, Julian's and, and, and Michael and others, sort of wrote papers and documenting. Sometimes it's more like a case study, sometimes it's more systematic about how investors engage with firms. Okay, so what am I going to do? I'm going to offer today um, a theory which is going to be slightly, I would say, different from, I think, what the existing literature stand. I'm going to take the issue of communication very seriously. I will show you exactly in what way. Um, and the main question I try to understand is, well, what are the conditions under which these communications from investors to firm is going to be an effective form of shareholder activism, okay? Um, in particular, what factors that contribute to these successful dialogues, and that could be interesting of its own we, if we have this evidence, this new data about the extent, the frequency of all of these meetings and, and phone calls and, and, and uh, interaction between investors and firms, then we need to potentially have a theory which you know, give us some idea what to expect, which factors should explain this type of um, engagements. Um, moreover, under what circumstances we expect investors to move on from this, what I call soft shareholder activism, more like um, 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 non-confrontational engagement, to more confrontational and public engagement, as we saw in the case of Elliott and BMC. And maybe also suggest, give an idea why it seems that most of these communications are held behind, uh, are basically uh, behind the scenes, they're sort of private, we're not aware, so my theory will have something to say about that as well. So this is um, basically where I'm going. So now, I'm basically last in the program today, it's always amused me a little bit when a theory paper is put at the end of, of a conference as if everyone is like enthused and ready to see some math. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to try to basically showing you as little math as I can, which I'm, my, I think I'm going to bring it to zero basically. So I'm promising not to show you any math, but still I want you to get a good idea about what the model is all about and then about the key intuitions and insight which the model delivers. So let's see if I'm going to be successful. Okay, so in my model, there's going to be a board, um, or manager, I'm not going to really differentiate between the two, and there's going to be an activist or investors. And the key, the key assumption here is, uh, in line with, actually with some Jill's ideas, is that the investor is going to have some information that complements the board information, okay? Uh, and the board itself is going to have its own agency problem. So we can think <laughs> of different, many reasons why directors are not going to be fully informed and why activists, at least on their proposal, might have information which is going to be um, um, uh, um, complement the board information. And the way I'm going to model communication, I'm going to um, use um, Chip Talk uh, from Crawford and Sobel. It's a seminal paper uh, which model how information is being transmitted strategically between a sender and receiver in a very sort of generic framework. I'm going to apply it to this context, context of shareholder activism. And the idea, there is going to be an idea that information is not going to be fully revealed as long as there is some conflict of interest. Why? Because potentially the activist is trying to convince managers to do things which are not necessarily in the best interest of managers. So you'll see that in a bit. Okay? And communication, at least in the baseline model, is going to be behind the scenes. 
in a, in a sense which I'm going to explain in a minute. Okay. So in my model, if the board is not responsive, is not reacting to this information shared by the activist, then the activist can either exit, sell his shares, uh, there's going to be a market maker, there's going to be some simple sort of microstructure model which endogenizes the, the decision to sell and the amount or the price that the activist is getting for his shares. And there's going to be a voice. So it's important, what I call voice is not literally speaking, that's going to be a communication. Uh, voice is going to be a public campaign which is going to be costly, but still it doesn't mean that the activist can simply unilaterally enforce some action on, on, on the firm. Um, it still requires convincing other shareholders to agree. So a public campaign is successful if and only if other shareholders are willing to support that. Okay? Um, so that's going to be the voice mechanism. Um, now, in my model, you will see that the board is going to accommodate the activist demand. And you can think of the demand, and this is how it's going to be in the model. There is the status quo, which generates some payoff, but there's also deviation from the status quo. Let's say, you know, the spinning of the company. And the payoff from that is going to be the private information of the activist. And the board might accommodate the demand, let's say, to spin off the company, either because it's persuaded by the activist's argument, the activist has enough credibility, convincing the board that that's actually going to increase firm value by you know, a um, significant amount, or because the activist was able to convince the board that if it doesn't follow through, then there's going to be a public campaign which is going to be successful. So the fear from a successful campaign, that's something which can also play out and will play out in the communication. And in my model, communication is going to be effective if and only if the activist is able to convey some information, reveal some information to the board, and at the same time, the board decision is going to be affected by that information that is shared by, by the activist. So it's all about transmitting information and or the ability of the activist to give a piece of information credibly to the invest to the board and the board reacting to that in some way. Okay? Another way to, to, to look at the model, again, there's not gonna be any math, but at least I want to make sure everyone are on the same page in terms of what the model is. So we're going to have the investors initially observing some private information, I call it theta, that's the benefit from spinning off the company, for example. There, there, is, there is going to be some behind the scenes communication, the investor is going to send a message based on his private information. It's behind the scenes in the sense that the market maker in the background and the other shareholders are not observing this message. Okay? Later on I'm going to show you, I'm going to um, say what happens when the, uh, that message is public. Okay? But for time being it's private. Um, then the board observes the message, it decides whether to keep the status quo, I call it L, or change it, take the right path. Um, investors observe the board decision, or at least he knows what the board is going to do, and then he can do one of uh, three things. He can either exit or remain passive, okay? Either of these cases, the board's decision is the final decision, firm's payoff is realized, or he can decide to launch a public campaign, which means he's not exiting, he's starting a campaign, which is costly, and if the campaign succeeds, that is if shareholders are willing to support based on everything they observe, um, then we're going to change f uh, the status quo of the firm and value will realize accordingly. If not, campaign fails, we are stick with the status quo, the original decision of the board. Okay? So we have communication and then um, the activist has the option either to exit, stay in the firm, do nothing, or be active. Okay? So as you can see, I'm trying to integrate all of these um, what we call sort of prominent governance mechanism into this framework, and again, one of the objectives would be to see the sort of interaction between the two, between the three. Okay, so what is the key sort of friction in this model before we get to the result, the main result? Um, how is information is being transmitted? So the way to think about it is as follows. This is the preference of the board over Tether, that's the benefit, let's say, from a spin-off, okay? Tether lower bar is the benefit from keeping the status quo, the firm as is, that's common knowledge. Better you can think of that as the private benefit of the board from keeping the status quo. Let's say they're just lazy or enjoy the quiet life, or whatever, you, any other reason why they wouldn't like to relinquish control and spin off the company or sell some of its assets. Okay? So from the board's perspective, as long as Teda is above that cutoff, is willing to go ahead and change the status quo of the firm. If it's not, is going to basically keep it as is. From the activist perspective, however, it doesn't have this private benefit. Okay? Uh, it can have some other private benefit if you will, but the important thing is that there is some difference between their willingness to change the status quo. The activist is just more, more eager 
to change the status quo, think that there is more value, or in other words, it's not internalizing this private benefit, which means that this cutoff is going to be here. And the key point is that you can see this shaded area, this is where there is disagreement between the activists and the board. And what it implies, it implies that the activist is trying to convince the board to change the status quo, you understand you cannot really tell the board that Theta, this state variable is, is here, because if it's here, well, the, the board is never going to change that. The activist is actually losing credibility because every, what the activist is going to do is going to always pretend that Theta, the true benefit from spinning of the company, is actually here. And in a model refraction expectation, what the board is going to understand is going to understand that every time the activist is recommending him to change the status quo, it has to be, the only thing we can infer is Theta is above that cap. <coughs> but nothing more. We don't know if it's here, we don't know it's, if it's here. This is where information is going to be lost in the process, and the amount of information that is exchanged depends on the credibility of the board, in particular of the activists. In particular, it depends on you know, how large is this private benefit. As you can imagine, the more, is, more private benefit the board has, the more conflict of interest, less information will be communicated. So what I'm going to do next, I'm basically going to add voice and exit separately and then combine, and I'm going to show you how this trade-off change. And basically that will tell us something about how the effectiveness of communication between the activists and the board will be um, affected by this um, uh, voice mechanism or governance mechanism. Okay, so the first result or the first point I want to make is that when voice is credible, then communication is more effective. Okay? And actually the intuition is quite simple in the sense that if the board understands that by ignoring the activists, the likelihood of a successful campaign is higher, then the board has more incentives to actually listen to the activist, which in turn increase the incentive of the activist to communicate with the board in the first place. So more information can be communicated. One way to see it, back to this um, diagram, is the activist campaign is sort of costly. So the activist, assuming the board is ignoring his demand to change the status quo, is willing to launch a campaign only if the benefit is also going to compensate the cost of this campaign. Okay, so you can see the threshold is higher. Okay? If shareholders are convinced that when the activist is launching a campaign, it's worthwhile supporting it, then the board um, is going to internalize it, at least partially, is going to understand if a campaign is going to be successful, it means that I'm going to suffer some cost. So there is a, in the model, there is a cost that the board is suffering if a campaign is successful. For example, directors are being fired or replaced. So he's more willing to listen, basically, to the activists. You can see this point relative to the original is moving a little bit to the left, in particular closer to the activist sort of optimal um, cutoff, which means that more information can be communicated, or what, what it really means that communication is going to be more effective. Okay? So the threat of voice, to the extent it's credible, is actually going to facilitate or enhance communication. But more important, also, what, what another sort of important feature of this is that communication itself, the fact that we are communicating, is also going to enhance the credibility of voice. So there is a feedback between the two. One way to think about it is that if we don't communicate, if the board doesn't know where Theta is, it doesn't really know, we just think that the likelihood of a campaign is just this number, is just this length of interval, right? But if we are communicating, if the activist is communicating with the, with the board, he's telling him whether we are in this region or that region, which means that conditional on the activist telling the board that he wants to change the status quo, there is the, the board must infer, oh, this activist is really serious. He really um, cares about changing the status quo. There is really a lot of value there. Therefore, the campaign is more likely if the board is going to ignore him. And therefore, the threat of a campaign is more effective, which again is going to increase the credibility of the activist. So you have this feedback between communication and voice. And ultimately, the result is that the possibility of voice is going to enhance communication. Why that might be important? Because empirically, we can see different things that might affect how easy it is or how likely activists will be su su successful in um, launching these public campaigns. You can think, for example, of different governance features such as um, one, you know, dual stocks, how entrenched is the board, how dispersed is the shareholder base, how easy it is to rally other shareholder support, and so on. And the model will predict that that should be positively correlated with communication. One thing to note is that if you have effective communication, you are less likely to observe voice. So the lack of, um, the fact that we don't see a lot of proxy fight or things which 
parameters which, like the cost of writing a proxy fight, things which should make proxy fight more um, successful, in fact, we should observe them less. We should observe less proxy fight. Why? Because it means that the threat is more credible. We can achieve more by communication. Okay, so the first result is that voice positively affect how communication can be effective. Now let's introduce exit. When we introduce exit, then there is sort of the standard effect in the literature, which is, you know, once you have voice and exit, there is some substitution. Instead of staying and launching a campaign, I might as well just sell if the price is sufficiently high. That might be better than trying to influence and change the status quo. This is what sometimes um, is referred to as the cut and run strategy, right? So that can happen. And what happens in this model, if you're more likely to exit, means that you are less likely to launch a campaign, so the threat is less credible, which means that communication is going to be less, um, less effective. But what is interesting, um, I'm sort of analyzing the paper, I show that exit, in fact, has a positive effect as well on communication. And I will show there is also an indirect effect through voice. Okay? So let me now consider what's the effect of exit without voice on communication. Okay? And I'm going to argue that exit is going to enhance communication or the possibility of selling your shares can actually make the activist more credible when communicating with the board for the following reason. So without exit, the activist is just facing the choice between keeping the status quo, getting this number at a lower bar, or changing it. But when you can exit, the activist actually has another option, right? It doesn't have to stick around for the long-term value of the firm. You can just sell and get whatever the price is. The price, by the way, in the model is, is endogenous, but for the sake of the presentation, I just assume it's exogenous. Okay? What it means, it means that from the activist perspective, it's really meaningful to talk to management only if the benefit from changing the status quo is sufficiently high to make him stay in the firm, even though he could exit. Okay? In other words, to say it is that the reason why information is not credibly communicated is because the board is worried that every time the activist is telling him that we should change the status quo, we should do a spin-off, the benefit might not, be hard, might not be high enough to justify the board to you know, forego its private benefits. With the option to exit, it's true that the activist is less likely to demand a change to the status quo, but whenever he demands a change to the status quo, it must be that the activist is really serious about it. Okay, it must, therefore, he has more credibility. Or another way to think about it is the activist is not going to inst insist on changing the status quo as often when he can exit because he doesn't have to stick around for the long run to realize this value. And that's important from the board perspective. The board is not worried as much about the activist is trying to um, um, over, uh, exaggerate basically the benefit from um, changing the status quo. So exit from that from, for that reason, exit can in fact make communication more effective. Think about all the things which affect the price. It could be the market microstructure, it could be the adverse selection, it could be the, um, um, just the liquidity motives for trade of the activists. All of these things will affect prices in the model. They generate some prediction with respect to how exit affects um, communication. Now, one comment I want to make before moving on is that Exit here is an effective form of governance, but for a very different reason from this paper of Alex Edmonds and Anat, Anat Martin and Paul Friedero. In their papers, just to remind everyone, exit is effective because managers care about the short-term prices. Okay? They care about peace. So whenever you sell, it's bad news, price dec decline. That's the reason why managers are not are trying to, be, um, to do the right thing from the shoulders perspective. That channel is not at all in play in this paper because in my, in my model, the board doesn't care about, um, ab about the short-term price, only about the long-term price. But you could add that, and then you get a very similar effect to what we have in the voice model in the sense that if managers are worried about low short-term prices, the best way to keep the activists in the firm is to follow his advice as opposed to ignore it. Okay, so similar result. Okay. Okay, so now what I want to do, I want to basically have a voice and exit uh, combined. So we have the previous, the first channel where voice is enhancing um, communication through the threat. Exit can also do it because it relaxes the tension of the activist. We said exit also has a negative effect on voice because you can cut and run. And I'm going to argue that exit also has a positive effect on voice. So if this red line implies substitution, this one implies complementarity. So how can exit make voice more effective, okay? So here is the idea, okay? The idea is basically, think about the activist. The activist 
can communicate with the board, and then if the board is not responsive, it can either exit or it can stay and launch a campaign. The fact that the activist decided to launch a campaign instead of exiting is actually it's very meaningful information for other shareholders. The activist has just demonstrated he's willing to put his money where his mouth is. He could have sold his shares for whatever it is the stock price, but he decided not to do that. Okay? What it means, it means that shareholders are more likely to trust the activist because he just demonstrated that the benefit has to be sufficiently high to incentivize him not to sell, which means that the threat of voice is going to be more credible and therefore communication is going to be more effective. Okay? So if I give you the option to exit but you decided not to exercise it, that's actually very meaningful for me. You just demonstrated that you're willing to um, put your money where your mouth is, therefore you're going to have more credibility from um, shareholders, therefore voice is going to be more effective. So again, this goes back to my assumption that it's not like the voice here, which is most, the, most of the literature are assuming that voice is like some action taken by activists which unilaterally change things. No, here it all depends on the ability of the activist to convince other shareholders to support his effort. And exit, or what we can infer from the decision of activists not to exit, is actually quite important. Okay, let me sort of skip that. Um, so, so that sort of, uh, sort of summarizes um, the main result, basically, one, one, one takeaway is that if you want to study communication, how it's effective, how effective it is, it's very hard to separate it out from exit and voice. And I would say also, if you want to study exit and voice, I think it's very important to study, to at least take, take into account the fact that when we observe proxy fight, for example, that's just an outcome of a failed um, uh, communication. Okay, so this is just summarizing why voice enhanced communication. Well, that's the, the best way to avoid intervention is compliance. So we can think about all the things that communication, all the things that ha makes voice more credible. That should explain more discussions uh, or more dialogues between firms and between investors and firms. Um, why ex exit enhanced communication? Two different reasons. It can relax the tension between activists and the board, but it can also enhance the credibility of voice by putting your money where your mouth is. So things which affect stock price, short-term stock price, you can see here, should actually predict more dialogues between investors and firms. Okay. Two minutes? Really? Okay. So I'm just going to say it. Um, uh, one thing which I think is this model is useful for is to say something about public versus private communication. And I'm going to, one of the results is basically that um, public communications are likely to be ineffective in this model, uh, which potentially justify why most of the pro communication we observe are behind the scenes. And the idea is the following. When communications is public, it means basically the market and other shareholders observe the dialogue between the investors and the firm. If you think that you can affect the board's decision by communicating with them, by sending these letters, that potentially is going to affect prices. If that's going to affect prices, that gives you incentives to manipulate prices. Uh, because you might as well take advantage of that trying to get the highest price and sell. And that's going to be basically destroy the credibility of the activist. So if boards think that the activist, if the message is public and the boards think that the activist has this incentive to manipulate, he's not going to follow through, he's not going to respond to that. The board, however, is going to respond to messages which are behind the scene that the market cannot really observe, which means that the activist has no incentives to manipulate. So that's one of the reasons why behind the scene communications is going to be more effective um, in this model. And the last thing I want to say, which is, um, um, without getting into too much details, is in this model, one of the, I think Jill was, speaking, was talking about it, but one of the most controversial assumptions in this paper is that activists or investors, outsiders, have some information that insiders potentially don't have. So one of the things which you do in the model, I say, well, I believe in that for many reasons that actually Jill was saying, but even if you don't buy this assumption, um, so I analyze what happens when actually we share the same information about at least the benefit of changing the status quo. So what else are activists are going to talk with firms, right? So they can, do, can talk about their own preferences, or get, they can talk potentially about how likely it is that the proxy fight will be successful. And one of the results that I show is that effective dialogues, assuming that the board is equally informed, effective dialogues or dialogues can be effective um, only if it's about some value relevant information. It cannot be that the activist is saying, oh, I know this, uh, this Vanguard, what Vanguard thinks about it, and I'm going to tell you if you're not going to support me. 
I'm not going to, f to follow my advice or my recommendation. I will go to Vanguard, we'll have a proxy fight. There's no credibility in that because activists always want to say that. They always want to say that, you know, um, that they're going to get support. The only credibility that activists can have if it's about their own belief. So you can think of a, a framework where there is a difference of opinions or just some sort of disagreement. And even though boards don't really learn per se anything about by how much a spin-off will interest firm value, they potentially learn something about how resilient these activists are, how determined they are to pursue a proxy fight, even if they disagree. And if you can learn about how persistent the activist is going to be, that actually might affect your decision, and that might lead to some effective dialogue and result with some um, potentially even an increase in shareholder value. So that's in the paper. Let me just, there is, uh, there is some literature, I'm happy to take some questions later. Let me just summarize in saying, um, the main premise is that, at least in the US, I think in other uh, jurisdictions as well, activists cannot simply force their ideas. So if you want to think about shareholder activism, you really have to take seriously the notion that at the end of the day, they have to convince someone, either the insiders, the board, or the, the, or the management, or other shareholders to support them. And this is really what this paper is all about. Uh, there are some interesting results with respect to the interaction with voice and exit why public communications are less effective, and what kind of information can potentially be communicated. I think that's all. Thank you.